Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, first called drummer to the stars, Craig Bissonette. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show coming to you from Music City, USA. And our guest today in sunny Los Angeles, as always, Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. How you doing, bud? Doing well. How are you? Hey, man, this is our second drummer today. We love drummers. Drummers, we have this beautiful fraternity. It's the, uh, it's a, a, it's a, it's a society, man, of mutual admiration. Today, I'm so excited, and I know that you're excited too, because when I was coming up, this is somebody that I really, really looked up to, and I've never stopped. He's so prolific. He's played all styles of music on the highest level. So we're talking rock, metal, funk, fusion, straight ahead pop. You hear him on TV and film. My friend, Greg Bissonette. How are you, man? Hey, hey, guys. I'm doing great. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Man, that makes me just want to get in the shed, man. You got the platinum records. You got the drums. You got the, you got the whiteboard. Ready to go. I'm ready to... I'm doing a lot of FaceTime, Skype, Zoom teaching from here. And uh, I have a studio not far away where all my drums are mic'd up. And I do a lot of recording. People send me files. So... It's a little bit of a different time now, isn't it, guys? Yeah. It is a different time, yeah. I, I spend a lot of time doing that in Nashville. I have Crash Studio where folks send me the files from around the world. And now my next thing is trying to get that kind of set up in sunny Los Angeles because I spend so much time out there. I love it. And you moved to Los Angeles in, was around 1981? I moved in 82. 82. Now, you said Music City. I thought L.A. was Music City, but you're calling it Nashville Music City. Right? Yeah, it's, it, it's kind of like, a, you know, the, um, the Chamber of Converse has... Uh, the Chamber of Converse. That's I love the always stars. <laughs> as always <laughs> called Chamber it, of uh, Chuck Taylors. Yeah, Chamber but I mean, of Taylor. <laughs> I mean, for for people that have had their head under a rock. I mean, you have played with people like David Lee Roth, Joe Satriani, the Ringo Starr All Star Band, Spinal Tap, Steve Vai, Electric Light Orchestra, Toto. The list goes on and on. And so you're just playing at the highest level with all sorts of people. I mean, that's kind of like rarefied air in the sense that you are playing all those styles of music at the highest level with the actual people that you hear on the radio. Many times you're playing on the records, you're doing the tours, and then I. I just look at things like your TV and film credits, and these are some of my favorite shows. Mad About You, Just Shoot Me, Friends, Wheel of Fortune. Then you get into movie soundtracks, and you're, you're looking at Sex in the City, Born Supremacy, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. What a career, man. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Rich. I'm very, very blessed, I'm telling you. Uh, these are things I've prayed about my whole life. You know, I want to be a drummer. I, w I want to make a living playing the drums, and God has graced me with being able to do that. I can remember in, in high school, uh, sitting at the dinner table with my parents and my mom and dad, both professional musicians in Detroit. My dad, a uh, jazz drummer. My mom played jazz vibes in his band, but they played weddings and private parties. And my brother, Matt, my favorite bass player, best pal, he plays bass with Elton John. He was Maynard Ferguson's bass player first, and through him, he kept my name going, and I got the gig with Maynard. But we played with David Lee Roth together, with ELO together, with Ringo. He's been out with Elton for the last six years. But he was sitting there, and my sister Kathy, who works for AEG Live, they do Coachella, they sure. run the Staples Center, the Greek Theater. We're a super musical family. And my parents just said, why do you want to go to this uh, Berkeley School of Music in Boston? It's worse weather than Detroit and worst drivers. You know, they said, why do you want to go to Boston? I said, well, Berkeley is the place to go, you know? And they said, well, what kind of degree are you going to get? Hmm. I said, well, I'm just going to get a performance degree. <clears throat> and then my dad said, why do you need a degree to perform? You're already performing all around Detroit. Why don't you do what the sax player in my wedding band did? Why don't you get a music ed degree so you can teach public school and have a pension and have the summers off and do cruise ship gigs and stuff, but have a, 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 a something to fall back on. I said, well, I know I want to move to LA and I want to play in the recording studios and I want to tour. And my heroes were like Ed Shaughnessy doing the tonight show and, and stuff like that. So they said, my band director actually said, what if you go to North Texas state? Cause you can 
Berkeley has two big bands at the time, 77. <clears throat> I'm 61, so I graduated in 77. And I was going to go to Berkeley in the fall of 77. My band director said they have three, two or three big bands at Berkeley. But at North Texas, they have nine big bands and right. three reading bands. So 12 big bands. It's like 125 drummers. And you can get a degree in music education. So you can go to L.A. And if you don't make enough money playing gigs and touring and recording, whatever you want to do, you can teach. And you can teach middle school band. Yeah. And you don't have to do high school marching band. And you don't have to stay. You can lock your door at 2 o'clock on a Friday and you come back at 8 a.m. on a Monday and you have the whole summers off. And my buddy teaches sixth grade math and science at a middle school and he gets 80 grand a year. And, and, and when he retires in two years, he's going to make 60 grand a year until he dies from his pension. Not so I thought, plan. I'm going to yeah. get that degree, you know. So I got the music ed degree where you went to school, Rich, North Texas State. Isn't that amazing? Just, yeah, I, I ended up doing, um, I, you know, I was a little sheltered growing up in El Paso, Texas. I was cutting my teeth musically, but my, I ended up meeting uh, this professor, Alan Shin, that teaches the jazz and percussion program at Texas Tech University. So I went there for four years, was a big fish in a small pond, did so much playing. Then I went to UNT when I was uh, 21, 22, and got my master's degree and got tons of experience and ended up playing. I worked my way up to the one clock lab band and so you did the records in 80 and 81 lab 80 and 81 i did lab 94 and it was a tribute to um the history of big band music so i was responsible for learning music from 1917 to the present at the time which was 1994 it was such an incredible experience well what was your degree I ended up getting in music education because it was it was like I tell all of my students, I say, look it, you don't need a degree to play, but you do need right. a degree to teach. So That's why right. not have that to fall back on? Yeah, beautiful. So you have a master's in music ed. I have a bachelor's in music ed. So That's well, fantastic. And you got a master's in music ed from... University of North Texas. Yeah, I was there with Ron Fink and Ed Sof and, and Slater and Chitroma. It was just incredible. I just had lunch with Ron last Monday. What a beautiful Dixieland drummer, man. He's got this oh, Dixie. Oh. Love that guy so much. So he was incredible. the bright light at North Texas for me. Well, he, he wrote in my book shiner. when I was leaving. He said, Rich, you're a real outdoorsman. Always hunting and fishing for the notes. <laughs> I'm oh, marimba, right? Yeah. yeah. He would say the same to me. I said, marimba, and this is not my jam. I'm a drum set guy. I'll play yellow after the rain to graduate, but it's the last time I'm going to touch a marimba, and it was. Oh, wow. So did you never, in the L.A. studio scene, you're always on the drums. So Born Supremacy happens. There's a 100-piece orchestra. The, the Simpty Codes rock, and you're reading these super long charts. You, you never had to go Born over and cover like xylophone parts or, or that no no that's not my jam I, that's too much stress man first of all you got to bring you got to own a xylophone right i don't want to own a xylophone or a, <laughs> own a marimba you know it's like it's a rent one? well they have cartage and so yeah. um the guy to do that for drum set and percussion is bernie dressel and so hmm. he, he has all that stuff he has timpani and marimbas that's just not my scene i don't enjoy it i don't enjoy playing timpani i don't enjoy playing marimba it was like a root canal for me i hated it <laughs> so i'm a drum set guy i want to play drum set. i played it to graduate you know yeah. and i could i could teach it if i was if I, if I was the middle school band director i could play yellow after the rain and but when Shatroma said, oh, I'm going to take you as my private student. I'm going to show you this modified muster. It's going to take about three hours a week of practice. I said, I'm on my way to play in Switzerland at the one o'clock. I'm getting my degree. I'm doing my student teaching. I'm playing in this funk band in Dallas, trying to put myself through school. The last time thing I have time for is for you to teach me some modified muster grip. I don't know who muster is, and I could care less. Thanks anyway. I'm going to Ron Fink. And Ron said, all right, let's do some hunting and fishing. Greg, was that the Buster Brown band? Yes, sir, Buster Brown. Yeah, because when I was in Dallas, I was playing in Dallas Brass and Electric, subbing for Carlock because we were in school. And then there was this cool band called Random Access. And then I played with Bill Tillman and the Horns from Hell. But I played in a band with George Anderson. He had this signature band, and I know you spent time with him. And there was this gal named... Connie and she passed, but I remember she was my girlfriend. She was your girlfriend. That's right. She died of bone cancer, man. Oh, when did yeah. that happen? Connie died of bone cancer about 10, 12 years ago, but oh, wow. she 
she was such a great, great keyboard player, such a great woman. And mm. she really got me into like George Duke. She would transcribe George Duke. So she was one of the reasons that Dan Hurley started the Zebras because of Connie. Wow. And she wow. programmed the synth on Lab 80 when, uh, when no, Lab 81, when Dan, uh, Tim Reese wrote a song called Yoda's Groove. Yeah. And it was a shuffle. Because about like a Rosanna kind of, actually we were ripping off Chick Corea's Secret Agent with Tom Breckline. And so this guy, Phil DeGreg, didn't know anything about synths and Connie had a Prophet 5 and so she programmed these cool sounds. And that sound on there, kind of George Dukey sound, that's because of Connie. She was amazing. That Cluster Brown was one of the most fun times I have. But I just said, look, I'm playing the game. I'm doing the rules. I'm passing these barriers. I hate playing timpani. I don't want to play timpani. Leave that yeah. to timpanists. I don't want to play xylophone or marimba or chimes or glockenspiel. I hate that stuff. I just want to play drum set. But you did said, it. Get me, yeah. <laughs> get me out of here. Get me my degree. Chitrama was pissed. But, hey, we pay those guys' salary. They don't pay our salary. So I'm sorry. Thank you for the offer. But I don't want to do it. I want to play. I'll study with Ron because he's cool. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> well, I know Jim's got a question burning on his lips. He's been like this. Hello. Oh, uh, yeah, well, that was like five minutes ago. I forgot I'm what it sorry. was. My, my, old, my old man brain. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm sitting here basking in the greatness of what you guys are talking about. And the one thing you guys can't say is that you haven't played with Slick Chicken in Danbury High School. So that's, that's something <laughs> uh, I've got to go Danbury, myself. Connecticut. I yeah. love Danbury. Isn't that where Toad's Place was? Toad's Place was New Haven. And Yale. Yeah. Tarsino yeah. Junction yeah. was in yeah. Danbury. Okay. Yeah. Well, Greg, cool. I, I just, I, you know, I had your, I had your picture uh, in my locker in high school. I aspired. You were a That's great. Weird. No, you were a great. <laughs> and I know that Jason Sutter and Jim Riley would say the same things because oh. you were pulling, you were living the dream that we wanted to, to yeah. live. And it was like, oh my God, here's a guy who did this, had took the same academic approach, but he's got all this street start smart musicianship. He's out there making it happen. And your career was just like, you did the lab band thing. You relocate to Los Angeles. You get the Maynard gig. You do this great live recording that had this amazing drum solo. Next thing you know, I was playing along to this transcription of Brandon Fields, the other side oh. of the story, the brain dance. Oh, thank you, Rich. That was so much fun. We used to play at the baked potato all the time. Uh, John Petitucci on bass and, and Brandon Fields on sax, Walt Fowler on trumpet, and David Garfield on piano. And the album came out, and then this great guy named Glenn Deitch, who was one of my students, he did a transcription. Modern drummer prints the transcription, and then they put the plastic record in there. And that yep. solo was Keith Carr, like said, he played that for his senior recital I'm like, hey, or his I, grad piece or something. I'm like, wow, Keith, you're blowing me away. I Ooh. did a performance of it, yeah, on one of those Friday oh. afternoon performances. But it's just such a beautifully um, executed, like, you have these uh, like these amazing little um, isms, Gregisms, little melodies that always pop up in your playing. And they're, I, I have stolen every well, one of them. Rich, they're not from me. Thank you so much, brother. But they're they're gadisms, and I had just moved to LA. They're Vinnyisms, all that. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, that's right out of my Walkman recording. Vinny at the Flying Jib, going home. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. And that's just ripped off of Vinny, ripped off a of Gad. And then I use the double pedal because I love double pedal. But uh, yeah, everybody, everything's borrowed from somebody else, right? Oh yeah. It's well, funny and, because thank you. Thank did you. you have did Rich? Did you what, do you remember how much? How many times did you watch Private Lesson? Over oh. and over and over and over. Did now does do you um? You know, I had a VO5 hot oil treatment <laughs> Dave Weckl mullet in 1992 and 1993. Do you ever look back and go, "Wow, that hey. hair"? Well, you know, mullets are coming back, man. So they are they are. coming you back? Might, no, I don't know. My son is 22, and uh, we watch. My daughter's 19, and we watch a lot of baseball. And so you're seeing these guys, those sunglasses, those wraparound yeah. tinted <laughs> like sunglasses, and uh, not spandex per se. But you go to the, I go to the gym and I swim an hour a day. I just ride the life cycle. I just swim instead of weights. But you go to the gym, and all these millennials and Gen Zs. Dudes have like pink, like Nike stretch pants and those sunglasses. And a lot of these guys here in LA, and I hate to hit the bag on Nash Vegas, but they tend they, they tend to set some trends here in LA. Yeah, they do. These guys are these guys in the gym, and these guys at the Troubadour and and the Dodgers. 
these guys have mullets, man. I'm going, whoa, <laughs> things really cycle. Yeah, when, when, when's the corduroys coming back? I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm ready for the corduroy. But anyway, so, so that album, that little thing in Modern Drummer, that just blew me away. And I never thought I'd be really close friends with my hero, Vinny, because you'd go to hear him in these clubs, guys. And he, every drummer in 1982, he was just off the road with Zappa, and every drummer would just swarm him after the set was over, and he, he, he'd be like, uh, and he'd just run out the club because everybody wanted a piece of him. And my buddy Bob Birch, who was Elton's bass player before my brother, he said, I got the perfect line. Here's how you can get in with Vinny. And I said, how? He goes, just tell him you'll collect the lint from his belly button for two years and make a pillow if he, if he answers your drumming questions about Gino Vanelli Nightwalk. <laughs> that didn't work. But we're really good friends now. The whole reason I got to do Born Supremacy was because Vinny called. And he yeah. goes, hey, man, this producer I work with all the time, he wants me to play three drummers on this movie, this Matt Damon movie he's doing. And there won't be <laughs> anybody there. We had the whole Fox soundstage, man, which is three drum sets. Each drummer got a column. And so we're reading these charts and we spent like three hours doing this incredible dr double drum, triple drum thing. And then at the end of the day, I go see the movie and it's a chase scene in Russia and the cars are just smashing and the trucks and the gun machine guns. You hardly even hear the drums. Really? Really? Check it out. It's kind of sad. Well, but I friends was sorry. Oh yeah, Friends. I mean, I, I Friends mean, every, was, every, every, what an amazing show! And it's just, it's just, it was a damp bop debut. Ah, uh, you know, it's like whoa, cha-ching. I just did a couple of episodes at my little studio for Family Guy in the last month, and it's the same. Yeah. <laughs> Off on three. Seth MacFarlane, he loves big band stuff, man. He does, man. Yeah. And Walter Murphy, the composer, he's just the coolest. And so basically, I'm doing. Do you know who Don Perry is? Totally. He oh, came yeah. He came to my birthday, 49th birthday party at the Fox and Hound of Ventura last year. Seth Rhodes Hall, right? Great guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Don, back in, I don't know what year it was, 92 or something, he says, hey, I can't do this Broadway uh, singer album with this uh, Debbie Shapiro Gravit was her name. And it's over on Lancashire at Track Records. Could you sub? I said, are you kidding? Does Dolly Parton sleep on her back? Yes. <laughs> I said, I will be there. That's PG-13. Oh, my God. It? That's sure. great. Sure. That's good humor. So anyway, so good I show image. up and I'm playing. And the, the keyboard player is really nice. A piano player. And he's from New York. His name is Michael Skloth. He said, man, I really dig hanging with you. And it's fun making music with you. My wife is creating this show. If it ever goes, I want you to play drums. And your brother. I love your brother. He's great. I want him to play bass. Well, the show goes. It's Marta Kaufman is his wife. Friends. So we did all 10 episodes. We didn't do the theme song because that was the Rembrandts, but we mm -hmm. did all the, the music in between, you know, when Jennifer Aniston gets off the couch and it's the bowling alley scene. And man, mm -hmm. the special payment's fun because one thing LA does have, not that Nashville doesn't have it or London doesn't have it at all, but the special payment's fun. You do sessions, they're in, you're in the union, yeah. you get paid, and once a year, you get a special payments fund check from the motion picture film industry TV motion picture check and a special payments for phonograph records. And the motion picture TV film check is always like eight times as much. Yes. And Friends is the big payout because that's syndicated. And so anyway, oh, that was the cool gig. It's on Netflix. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> anyway. And so so, so even, even with Netflix, it still gets honored. You know, that, now they're watching YouTube stuff. And if it's union stuff and it's played on YouTube and there's enough hits, you get a, uh, I forget the name of it, the American Federation of Musicians, special payments for multimedia or something yes. like that. But the, the union's on it. And then there's the RMA, the Recording Musicians Association, because in New York and L.A., there's probably only about 100 musicians that really fund the uh, AF of them. Yes. And I know Nashville's more like Texas. It's like a right-to-work thing, which is amazing, you know. But the union's pretty amazing, too. Yeah. Oh yeah, I look forward to that check every April, and it's like, all right, I'm putting a deck on. I am, uh, I'm leasing a new car. I'm getting Is divorced. Stuff that you did uh, here, or stuff you did in Nashville. And stuff I do in Nashville, like for like for the last twenty years, playing on like records, you know, that you can buy at Walmart or Target. Um, but uh, so you do union sessions in Nashville. You do union sessions in Nashville. Yeah, the stuff uh, that I, I do is more non-union yeah. there. No, well, okay. it's I'm like all of us that are working on records. We're in the union, but it's interesting 
interesting because it is a right to work state. So when the guys in my band and we all play like the Tonight Show, um, they have to pay work dues even they're even though they're not in the union. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, a, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 a crazy thing. But well, that that is a, a big feather in your cap, and that is a. I mean, I'm sure you look forward to that check every year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish I wish that I did more. Like I'm hoping, that, you know, this Family Guy, they're going to be syndicated forever. I like a lot of those movies. You know, I just wish that I, I, I talked to before Joe Percaro passed and Emil Richards passed since the '60s and '70s. I mean, Emil Richards does the finger snaps on Adam's family. Is that so, it, I mean, Adam? those, Yeah, that's retro money right there. Yeah, wow. it, it, it keeps compounding. It's the it's the gift that keeps on giving. You know. That's, that's the a, time of year I go out and buy a Lambo. That's well, you're a voiceover guy, so you're SAG after. That's musician I union skate. Oh, you're not? No. no. You don't do union voiceover? I, I never really pursued it that hard to get out. I, ah. I do. I do. Hi, thank you for calling ABC Company. Press one for sales. Press two I got for sales. Non that kind of stuff. Because yeah. yeah. if you do union after or SAG stuff, I remember the first time I did a Winnie the Pooh session, I said, so. I'll just do scale. They said, yeah, scale. We rarely pay double scale because, you know, musicians union, AF of them scale. We'll mm -hmm. put it this way. Musicians union, AF of them double scale, which Rich and I charge double scale. Most people charge double scale when they've done a lot of stuff. So it's 750 bucks for three hours. They don't really have a one hour session. They don't say, hey, I got one tune. Can you do an hour? No, it's a session. It's three hours. Hal Blaine helped start that. So it's 750 bucks, double scale for three hours. An hour for single scale after one hour is 1250 bucks. Yeah. Uh, I'm just not that good, so, I guess. No, no you're yeah. good. You should, you should join after. You should join, buddy. Yeah. And then just, yeah. Like, so um, are you in Connecticut now? I'm in uh, Spring Hill, Tennessee. I'm just south of Nashville. You should do Nashville voiceovers and do it through after. How did the Nashville. how did that Winnie the Pooh job? It's an interesting story attached to that, right? Yeah, well, my brother Matt, who was a North Texas guy, he got the gig with Maynard first, and then we ended up playing together with Maynard, with David Lee Roth. When Billy Sheehan left, David Lee Roth, Dave hired Matt <clears throat> with Gino Vanelli, with uh, ELO and uh, Ringo, Rick Springfield, Joe Satriani. We've done so many gigs together. We've had bands like the Mustard Seeds. Now we have a band called the Redcoats and another band with Rick Springfield called the Locusts. We're always doing stuff together. He's my favorite bass player. And he was playing upright with a couple of gobos in between us. And we were doing the end theme for Finding Nemo. And it was a big band version of Bobby Darren's Somewhere Beyond the Sea. And my chart, guys, it looked like it was written by a third grader. The, the producer's talking about DS, double DS, Coda, double Coda. I didn't have, I said, hey, Matt, I don't have a double DS. I don't even have a regular DS. I don't have a Coda or a double Coda. Let me see your chart. And the vice president of Disney, Rick Dempsey of Disney Character Voices, gets on the talk back and says, drummer, could you please come in the control room? Drummer. So I, <laughs> Hello, drummer. I brought, I brought my chart. I'm, I'm going to show these guys. I don't have a Coda. I don't have a double Coda. And I go, so I don't have, he goes, stop. Say what you just said to your brother. I said, hey, Matt, I don't have it. He goes, right there, that rasp, that high rasp. It's got that Sterling Holloway sound. I said, Sterling Holloway, the guy that was on Green Acres, and it's a gift with W.C. Fields. He said, yeah, Walt handpicked him in 1946 to be the voice of the stork in Dumbo, Dumbo, the elephant Dumbo. And then in 68, he handpicked Sterling Holloway's voice. Oh, bother. I need a small smackerel of honey to be the voice of Winnie the Pooh, his new book and his new mm. movie uh, in 1968, The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. And the main Winnie the Pooh, Jim Cummings, can't always make all the, you know, the little plush toys or the computers or the, the ride at Disneyland. So we need another Winnie the Pooh. Awesome. And I went, man, I would transcribe every little diphthong and every accent and every up and down, every dynamic. I joked that I used to transcribe Vinny, but now I transcribe Winnie. Oh my God. <laughs> what a, what a cool thing, Greg. Cause I, I mean, I have a little, you know, VO demo and I've been studying acting for the last five years. I got my SAG card as an actor and it's really fun. And it, there's so many commonalities in, in the rhythm and the music that we have of being a trained musician. I, I took a class one time with uh, um, this famous actress's coach and, and they're like, yeah, your music, music is a great training ground 
for thespians because it, there's so many commonalities with dynamics and accents and, you know, it's, so I can One see the, you doing that. Well, thank you. I'm just so happy you're doing it too. One of the best, because uh, I'll be in these auditions with people that have been doing drama. They've been reading things since, we started playing snare totally. drum, Haskell hard stuff. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're late bloomers, but I, in the lessons I take, one of the best, um, one of the best coaching uh, pieces of advice I ever got is to put commas in randomly, like William Shatner. I think we need to go down there, Scotty. <laughs> and you put these, you put these commas in these crazy places, and you make it your own. You know, yeah. And so I'm, I'm just inserting commas in the script, but I also get to listen to these guys before me. So I'm making, because I have an agent and they recommend you for auditions and you show up and there's 20 people sitting in the lobby and they're all doing their lines and they're making notes on the page. And I'm going, this is serious, man. It's as serious as the drumming industry. You know, <laughs> we, we, we all compete for gigs. It's friendly competition. In voiceover, it ain't always that friendly. Well, so, yeah. I mean, I've been in the room many times where you walk in and the casting director is there and you go and you do your thing. Thank you very much, you know. Um, so, for VO, is it the same thing where you're just sitting there right in front of the casting director instead of having to have it memorized? You just got your script and you're doing a read, right? Absolutely. Most of the auditions are in a studio and the casting director's in the studio and they record it. And you never, ever get someone saying, thanks so, you know, like a day later, thanks so much for coming down. We decided to go with, you know, Brad Pitt because we're going to pay the extra money and use his actual voice. I would do a lot of voices. I played drums on Super Bad and a lot of those movies. I would like love to, in the filming of the drumming music, I would love to kind of emulate Jonah Nimoy. Uh, not Jonah Nimoy, Jonah Hill's voice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, man, you know, I kind of got that thing. So I would do some sound likes for him or for Albert Brooks. I did some Finding Nemo stuff. Oh, my God. Nemo, come back! Because they're that oh rasp, gosh. right? But then what happens is if they decide to pay for Albert Brooks or Jonah Hill or whoever they're looking for, you won't get a nice person from SAG after or even from your agency going, Rich, thanks so much for coming down. They decided to go with Jonah Nemo. You don't hear anything, no, at least no, with drum one. gigs. If you don't get the gig with, you know, uh, whoever the band is, you know, they don't. They at least call you back and say, hey, thanks for coming down, man. Yeah. We decided to go with, it ain't like that in voiceover. No. Yeah. They're too busy. Brutal. Or, or they just kind of jive. Yeah. Kind of not the, the people skills that we have as yeah. drummers or musicians. We are a fraternity. Voiceover, man, it's brutal. It's yeah. like ballet. My daughter was a yeah. ballerina. It's like dancing, ballet, real catty. Voiceover is pretty, pretty hardcore. Black yeah, swan. Yeah. Black <laughs> swan, man. That's well, listen, exactly Greg, I, I know that you're a product of music education. Jim is self-taught. He's like, man, I just got a drum and <laughs> drum set and just started playing along with things. But our, our show is sponsored by the School of Rock, and I know you've been involved with them. There's 250 locations. There's more than 250 locations. We've got two amazing locations here in Nashville. We've got Nashville and Franklin. They're both building a third location in Mount Juliet, and it's just a great thing because the kids jump head first into the pool they're playing music in a band they're learning how to play drums keyboards they're singing they're slapping the bass they're playing guitar and they learn how to work as part of a team and take direction and show up on time all these cool life skills so if you want to get your kids involved parents you want to add to the ballet and the soccer and the baseball and the piano lessons get your kids involved with school of rock jim how do they how do they enroll franklin at school of rock.com or nashville at school of rock Dot com. All right. We love the School of Rock, man. There's so many locations in L.A. There's one in Burbank. There's everywhere. <clears throat> Didn't uh, Frankie Avalon or something start the one in L.A. years ago? I, I don't know Frankie Avalon. It was, it's, there, was a, there was a guy that, like, literally the movie was based on this guy that had his, you know, this, this backwoods. He just started it, you know, like Jack Black, and then it became a franchise. But, okay, well, somebody in L.A. Uh, didn't it start in L.A.? Um, I'd have to do my research, but uh, hey. I think, I think uh, Frankie Avalon rings a bell, but there's somebody, it's an Italian guy, and hey. he started the one that was in a, in a Agora, one of the first ones, School of Rock, like 20 years, 30 years ago. Anyway, yeah. I'm, not that, I'm not familiar with who started it, but it was a pretty cool story, and of course, you love the Jack Black one, and uh, 
I would love to mention my drum school if I could. Please do at the drum channel. Yeah, I have a drum school. It's just my name, Greg Bisson at Drum School. You can look on my website, gregbissonette.com, or you can go to Drum Channel's website. But for 10 years, I've been compiling footage for this drum school, and it's all out at Drum Channel. And it's just every style, and the main theme is vocabulary, because that's the way I teach. I do a lot of private lessons also with FaceTime and Zoom and Skype. And I do, like, like Rich is saying, recording sessions for people from all over the world that send me files. All they have to do is send it to uh, my manager that answers it at gregdrums2 at gmail.com so they can book me for sessions or for lessons. But that's all I do at the drum school is talk about vocabulary, drumming vocabulary, different beats and different fills in every style you could ever imagine, from straight ahead to playing with brushes, small group, big band, to playing rock, playing uh, R&B, playing Afro-Cuban, Brazilian country, reggae, you name it, any, any style. I just love delving into it. And Rich, it's funny because when you and I, you grew up in Texas, but I'm a Yankee. I'm from Detroit. So when I went to school, my parents couldn't afford to put all three kids through college. So they said, you're on your own. We'll buy you your first car. And I played country for pretty much the first two years because in Denton and in Fort Worth and in McKinney and, and Bonham, Texas, talk about the outskirts of uh, the Metroplex, you know, the Golden Triangle. It was all train beats, and I'd never played a train beat. Right. I think maybe in my Detroit wedding band, we played a version of Jamie Oldacre playing on Clapton's Lay Down Sally. That's yeah. a train beat. But I never knew about Willie Nelson. I, knew about, I never knew about playing, you know, train beats, or I didn't get into Merle Haggard. I ended up playing with him before he died. I played with the Countrymen for the Grammy subbing for Kenny Aronoff kind of thing, or the Highwaymen, they were called. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. uh, so... I mean, I'm not anywhere near as deep into it as you are, but I love, and I got this love for country playing down in Texas. And a couple of years ago, Stan Lynch, my good friend from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, he hires me to play on, I had done several records with Don Henley. And Dan and Stan, uh, Don Henley and Stan are in the control room. We're up at Ramirez Road, Henley Mansion up there where the, Eagles records were done. And Don says, Greg, could you do something that's kind of like that beat that, uh, you know, it's on the snare. And I go, Don, would you get out of here, man? You're a drummer. I know you don't like playing on your own solo albums, but you played on all the Eagles albums. Yeah. For me, it's the, it's the Beatles, the Eagles, the police, you know, Led Zeppelin, the Foo Led Fighters. Zeppelin, I mean, yeah. I love the Eagles. Play what you want. And he goes, well, it's kind of a thing you know, with brushes, I think. And it's kind of like this. And he starts going, ticka, tucka, ticka, tucka, tucka. Go, Don, that's a train beat. You're from <laughs> East Texas. Oh, yeah, train beat. Could you do that? And it was on that Cass County country album he did. But I love country music. Well, it's it's so funny. Jim will tell you we're, we're both Canadians. I'm from Milford, Connecticut, so I am literally the most unlikely country drummer. And and I went down your path trying to prepare myself to do a million things, and then opportunity knocks, and the next thing I know, I'm uh, I meet a, a guy in a cowboy hat, Jason Aldean, and it was the same band playing on every television show, and every record, and in every music video for the last 21 years. That is a cool gig right there. Crazy. That's that's awesome. Jim, you got something on your lips there? I did, and I completely forgot it again. Come on, Jim. You got to write <laughs> these things down. Um, I do. <laughs> I now remember it. Um, okay. Going back to the um, – and then we brought this back up in the, in the last episode with uh, Mr. Cooper. Where were you when you found out about Neil? Do you remember what you were doing? Because you do. played with him at Burning for Buddy. Yeah. Well, Neil and I were really good friends, and um, – He'd come over here in this very room, and we'd play double drums together. And the last time we played together, he said, hey, why don't – I said, what do you feel like playing today, Neil? He said, do you want to – you mind if we just play in three? I said, sure. What kind of three? Like jazz waltz three, Brazilian samba three, rock three, funk three, brushes? He says, anything. I just want to work on my three, four playing. So for this Modern Drummer tribute uh, last week on, some, on September 12th, his I birthday. saw it, and it's amazing. Great drum solo. Oh, thank you, Rich. Awesome. Well, it's all in three because we played together in three, and a lot of things were cut out. Steve Smith, a lot of the guys told me that things were cut out because it would have been 10 hours. But th that one day, we 
went on a, for a boat ride. I had a boat on this lake, West Lake Lake, out here where I live. And he's a lake guy because he's from St. Catharines. And I'm from Warren, Michigan, a lot of lakes, you know, everywhere in Michigan. So every bird that flew and landed on the lake, every fish that jumped out of the lake, he knew the names of. He was just that kind of guy that mm -hmm. really was super into learning foreign languages and just super book smart. And anyway, um, Don Perry uh, and I, we, we kind of got to know Neil better at Mark Cranny's funeral. Mark was the drummer with with uh, Jean-Luc Ponty and Gino Vanelli and, and Jean-Luc Ponty opened up for Rush. And I remember Neil sending a check to, to Mark when we had a big benefit, Myron Grombacher and Don Perry and I in the Woodland Hills Drum Club. We had this benefit because Steve Smith got involved and all these people got involved because Mark needed a new kidney. Anyway, Neil sent him a check and Don, Don kept the most in touch with Neil and they had this bond. Because Don has a book deal. Don is Don's father was a pretty well-known writer, and Don gave the eulogy at his father's funeral, and the book company was there, and they said, "Man, do you have a book deal? That's the most eloquent, you know, uh, uh, speech we've ever heard." And he said, "No, I don't, but I'd love one." They gave him a book deal, and so Neil, writing all the lyrics for all the Rush songs, Neil and I, I'd say Neil and Don and Chris Stanky from Sabian and Neil, that that was like the closest. Thing. And Neil said, you will not tell anybody that I have brain cancer. So for three years, I would ask Don, what's going on with Neil? He's not returning my calls. I'd ask Chris Stinky. Yeah, they were so tight-lipped, they didn't say a word. Right. And, and then we yeah. found out he passed. And mm -hmm. it was from Don that I found out. So he was a very private guy, Neil. Yeah. Very private. But a wonderful guy. Mm. Yeah, man. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. This is The Rich Redman Show. Greg, let's talk about, you know, I think you were probably like 27 years old or something at the time when you got the David Lee Roth gig. I mean, that was a, a life-changing opportunity for you. What was that like, man? Can we? Can I preface real quick? We had Ray sure. Rozier on. Oh, yeah. His stories and his impression of David Lee Roth is hilarious. I it's recommended Ray, story. but I left. Yeah. yeah. Dave didn't know who he was. I said, there's this guy. He's a shrapnel guy. He plays on these Mike Barney shrapnel albums. I go, and he's a really nice guy. He's a cool guy. I wouldn't say nice to Dave, but I said, he's a cool guy. Because people skills are half half the pie. You know, how do you play? And how are you with people? Sure. And so I said, Ray is a, I didn't know him that well, but I said, I've talked to him on the phone. He's on these albums. I played him a bunch of cassettes. And he hired Ray. Ray went down and played and he hired. But I, I didn't know Dave had let Ben Halen and Myron Grombacher, one of my best friends, recommended me to audition for Vinnie Vincent's band. Vinnie Vincent was the guitar player after Ace Freely with Kiss, and he, he had left. He did Lick It Up, and he wrote some songs, and they left Kiss, and he was starting the Vinnie Vincent invasion in yeah. 1985. And so I went down to this audition, and it was basically playing to the tracks with the drums taken off, but the PA speakers are in front of the drums, so you can't really hear it very well, and you know, no click, and you're just, and he goes, okay, that was cool, man, I enjoyed it, man, and I'm glad you came down, before we do another song, though, I just didn't want to cancel you coming down, um, but I just, you know, want to tell you, I, yesterday, I picked a, a drummer from Texas that knows all my songs, I sent him you know, some of the files, and he learned all the songs, and he drove out here in a Winnebago with his drums. <laughs> so I gave him the gig. So who's that? Was that um, Bobby Rock? Bobby Rock. Yeah. I said, his name is Bobby Rock. He goes, well, I don't know, but that's the name he's using. Like Zorro, you know. Zorro, yeah. what's your real name? I'm not telling anybody. So anyway, Bobby <laughs> Rock got the gig. But Benny Vincent said, I really love the way you play, man. You'd be great for Dave Roth's band. I said, Dave Roth, who's that? He said, David Lee Roth. I said, David Lee Roth's in Van Halen. He said, not anymore. 
he quit Van Halen and he got Billy Sheehan to play the bass. And, and just a couple of days ago, they hired Steve Vai and they're looking for a drummer here. Call Steve Vai. So anyway, wow. there you go. And then the audition, I remember reading it in Modern Drummer where they're like putting you through the paces. You got to learn songs. You're charting little charts on your snare drum. They ask you for a drum solo. Is that all like uh, urban legends or is that some, there's some truth in there? That's all very true. And what happened is there's a big, long line outside of SIR. And I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I, luckily, I was like, I don't know, 10th in line or something. And there's a big, long line behind me. I said, this is what you call a cattle call. They, did not, they didn't advertise it as a David Lee Roth band audition, or it would have been a, a mile long. They auditioned <laughs> it. They advertised it in the recycler, this little rag sheet, like the Village Voice in New York. Um, Steve Vai looking for a drummer for his band. Mm. Well, it wasn't the Steve Vai band. I already knew. It was the you know David Lee Roth band, so because of Vinnie Vincent telling me. So <clears throat> the first guy that walks out is a friend of mine that I knew from being in a band with my brother, and and they would play at this club called Sash. It's where a lot of bands got signed. And did you guys ever see Pee Wee's Big Adventure? Sure. Yeah. With the dinosaurs what over there when you're going towards Palm Springs. Exactly. What was Pee Wee's girlfriend's name? I forget. Uh... Oh, man, Dottie. I know it. Dottie. Dottie. Right. Ah, Dottie. Yeah. There's no basement in the animal. Ah, what? And so Dottie, his bike gets stolen. And Dottie, her name's E.G. Daly. She's a really good singer. And my brother, Matt, was in E.G. Daly's band with this guy that's walking out named Matt Sorum. And I said, hey, Matt, how'd it go? He goes, oh, man. He's got that Sacramento. Oh, man. You know, they wanted me to play double bass, and they, I had to put together this old Ludwig kit with these bass. I don't really play double bass. I'm going, okay, I'm warming up my feet. Okay, get the double bass going. And I already knew Hot for Teacher. I was a big double bass fan from the Maynard days, being the first guy to road test the DW pedal for Donald yeah. Barty. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm thinking double bass, double bass, double bass. And the next guy walks out, and he's from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Any idea who this drummer is? And he says, and he went to North Texas, and he came out a week after I did to L.A. I said, Russ, how'd it go? Russ McKinnon, and he goes, ah. they, he said, they said I didn't hit hard enough. And I'm going, okay, hit hard. Huh, huh, yeah. And then You're I was doing recon, into, man. I was doing recon, baby. <laughs> yes. And then another guy I didn't know walked out, but he was talking to somebody else. And he said, man, they had all this crazy Odd time stuff and Steve Vai, the Zappa thing. I'm going, those are five. Five. What's the tip of five? What's the tip of five? I know how to play five. And I had a Sharpie, as most drummers do, in my back pocket. And I had Mark Cranny's lucky uh, Black Beauty snare he loaned me. And I said, this is a white Remo coated head on here. I can write. So I walk in. The first thing I did, I don't think a lot of these people did that. I said, Steve, man. I'm a huge fan of yours. You transcribed the black page, Bozio for Zappa. He goes, yeah. I said, I saw you play with your band at the club lingerie. He said, you did? I said, yeah, Billy Sheehan, man, Talis. I love your band. I wasn't telling lies. I was fans of these guys, but that's just people skills. You know, sure. you gotta, you want to be in a band with people that you like, that you get along with, you know? And so they said, well, hey man, if you wouldn't mind, could you just play a drum solo? And, I went to North Texas, like you, Rich. I love playing drum solos. I got to play a drum solo with Maynard. And so, of course, I just put the other double bass drum there, and I start playing Hot for Teacher. Then I start doing kind of a Louis Belson double bass thing. Then I start doing, you know, kind of loud gad stuff. But I do a lot of bottom stuff, and I do kind of um, cozy Cole, Cozy Powell, rather, Cozy Powell stuff. And I do some Tommy Aldridge licks. But I do a lot of Alex Van Halen ish stuff because David Lee Roth was in a band with Alex Van Halen. Yeah. Don't go in there and play, you know, Ringo beats. They're, they're talking about you being the drummer with Dave, the new David Lee Roth version of Van Halen. So they both said, man, that's cool. And Steve goes, let me ask you something, man. And he starts playing these crazy rhythms, you know, da, 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 da. Play a fail, play a solo, play a fail. Now, guitar over those breaks. Bye -bye. And I'm right. One, two, three, four, and one, two. He goes, man, you can transcribe quickly? I said, yeah, I do it all the time. He goes, where'd you learn that? I said, I went to North Texas State. He said, I went to Berkeley. I said, I know you did, man. I'm a fan of yours. You know, you transcribed the black page. He said, you know what, man? 
I'm going to be able to show you my tunes really easy. I like you. I like the way you play. And he and Billy both said, you got my vote. We're going to tell Dave you're the guy. I'm like, what? So I call him on the old payphone yeah. later that day. I said, Steve, do you have any cassette tapes of any of your songs you guys have been writing for the last month? He said, yeah, we have like 12 songs written. I said, can I come to your house and borrow the cassettes? I'll take really good care of them. But I want to make like little file card charts of the songs. He goes, that would be great. Dave's going to love it. So I, I write all the – and so we're playing the songs. And Dave's walking around his mansion listening through the air conditioning ducts. He comes down and he goes, how'd you learn all these songs so fast? The guys just discovered you yesterday. It's like a Christopher Columbus or something. You know, they just <laughs> discovered you yesterday. I said, well, Dave, I made these form charts of all the songs. He goes, you read music, bro? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you, I said, yeah, I, re I read music and I write tra charts for stuff. He goes, who was your last gig? And I thought, man, I'm going to be dead in the water. He's going to think it's lame pop. I said, well, Gino Vanelli, in fact, I'm still kind of playing with him. If I get this gig like I might, I got to tell him I'm not in the band anymore. He goes, Gino Vanelli, Nightwalker, brother to brother, storm and set up. Tell Gino, I said, hi, Dave knows music. He said, what about before that? And I'm going, man, now I'm really going to be dead in the water. I said, Maynard Ferguson. He goes, you mean the high note trumpet player that covered theme from Rocky and Herbie Hancock's Chameleon? I said, yeah, Dave, I can't believe you know that. He goes, if you can power for that, Big band, you can power the four of us. Welcome to the band. Payday starts Friday. Let's go get some Mex food. I so we go, we go in his convertible lowrider, and he puts on a cassette of Frank Sinatra's That's Life with the big band. He goes, I bet you can play this, can't you? And I said, oh, Frank Sinatra's That's Life. That's Life. I said, yeah. He goes, we're going to put this on the first album. Eat yeah. him and smile. So he goes, you're the perfect guy because you play big band. You never know, kids. The different styles that you learn, everything's related. Duke Ellington once said, there's two kind of music, good and bad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what a story. I, I tell the kids, look at, look at the, 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 the styles, they cross-pollinate. So I said, look at Stevie, you know, playing on Superstition. I said, just isolate the right hand. That's Jazz Ride. Exactly. That's jazz ride, man. And then when you play in a in a in a uh, Bob Marley tribute band, these reggae drummers, there's all sorts of swing going on on the hi hat, and that that is the glue. And then you got the backbeat on beat three, so you just got to learn these little tricks, and then you could swim in all these different waters. Absolutely, Rich. That's exactly the the thing I preach at my drum school and in the private lessons, and when I do clinics. You know, so many people are so you know, horse with blinders with one style, man. And there's a lot of great music. I'm not the biggest fan of every kind of vocal. Like, I, I don't love super hardcore Cookie Monster death metal stuff. Yeah. But I, I sure love the drumming. I love Meshuga because of Thomas Hawke. Oh, yeah. Not because of uh, 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 Cookie Monster. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love, you know, Quest Love, and I love all Chris Dave and the drunk drumming thing and hip-hop and but I, I'm not the biggest fan of like super hardcore gangster, you know, lyrics that just yeah. aren't the way that I live my life. So I don't really love listening to the lyrics, but I love the drum groups, you know. Jim, you've seen a Greg Bissonette clinic, haven't you? I, I've seen two of them. Yeah. Ah. yeah. Well, and that was always. One of them I learned that you can isolate any Beatles song and identify the Beatles song by the drums only. Jim, if we yeah. didn't have. Uh, Limits on the Zoom audio. I'd play those for you right now. These got to do scratch. These got to do scratch. Or do bra boom boom bra boom boom bra boom. Can I tell you a funny Ringo story about that song? Come on. So tomorrow never knows. For those of you who aren't Beatle geeks like we are, tomorrow never knows is Ringo playing. Did it? Did it? And he overdubs a tambourine. So I've got a tambourine pedal that I designed with Don Lombardi with DW. And we also have an LP one because now Don, Don Lombardi owns LP too. So I'm playing get it. And he behind his drums and starts playing it. And it was light went on. He's not doing what I'm doing. I'm doing this. But he's doing this. Left. I said, Ringo, wow, you played the dada with your left hand. He said, why wouldn't I? I'm left-handed. And the way you're doing it, brother, 
you're losing the the, the, the ride for the, the crash for that time. You're going, da -da, he said, you got to do it this way. His left is so consistent. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. And with the Tom head, mine's a 12, his is a 13. It's kind of low. Da -da, da -da, every There's time. no rebound. <laughs> There's no rebound. His were mm. way cleaner. So, Anyway, that I got a lot of cool Ringo stories. No, I, I bet. I bet. I mean, what is what is that like backing up? I mean, uh, a, beetle? Uh, a beetle. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, when you're playing double drums with him, you're just staring at his snare drum, going, "Don't flam with Ringo." And he'll put the on the verse. He's so musical. Verses. He'll put the. The, the, the stick in the middle of the snare choruses you'll be bapping rim shots with the conk you know something that not a lot of drummers know i didn't know until he told me five years ago he used the same exact snare drum on every single Beatles song he took that to the ed sullivan show he flew over the atlantic with it that whether it's i want to hold your hand or day in the life or get back on the roof. It's that same snare drum. He just tuned it differently. Capskin hmm. heads, plastic heads, high, low. Yeah. I never knew that. I thought it was a deeper snare for the deep stuff. High snare for the early Beatles stuff. Same snare drum. One I've snare drum. So much. The one he bought at uh, a place in London, uh, Ivor Arbiter's Drum City. He walked in. He and Brian Epstein and Ivor. He. He wanted a Ludwig kit, and Ivor was the distributor for Ludwig in 62. And so he said, I want a Ludwig kit. And he said, I have this downbeat kit. It's a jazz kit, a 20 and a 12 and a 14. But instead of the little kind of piccolo downbeats Ludwig snare, I've got this five and a half by 14. And that's what I'm going to sell to you now if you want it. And he said, absolutely. He said, the guy next door makes signs. What's the name of your band? And, and Brian Epstein said, it's called the Beatles. He says, that's a horrible name. That'll never fly. <laughs> and so he got the head back the next day and it said, the Beatles, Ludwig. And Brian Epstein said, no, no, no. If Ludwig's going to be that big, make the Beatles bigger and put a drop T on that, you know, old English logo thing. Yeah. Not old English, but that drop T. So anyway, that snare drum is this snare on every Beatles song. It was it like a, it was like a, like a sort of like a super ish no, it's not a metal snare. It's a wood snare. It's oh. a five, in, five and a half wood snare. And when we did the thing at the Grammy Museum a few years ago, um, he said, look at that burn on the side of the drum there. I said, wow, what is it? It's about this much of a burn. He said, John and Paul would be writing and George too. And he'd just be sitting there and he always <laughs> smoked. So his cigarette burned right into the plastic wrap. But it's a wood drum. Wow. So Come on, Greg, Rich, you're a drum geek. You didn't think Ringo played a metal snare? Did you? I'm not like a super super gear guy, which I yeah, actually, yeah. which I'm actually happy about. Um, yeah, but I, don't, I don't play vintage stuff for that reason. People go, "Don't you have a vintage drum collection?" I go, "Vintage drums are old when you hit them, and especially those raised lugs. You got to make sure you don't hit the dang lug when you're playing a backbeat." You know, I said I like new drums because they are new. And they last longer. <laughs> and they sound I'm with you, good. I'm with you. And they sound good. And they keep getting better, not worse. So I'm not a vintage <laughs> drum guy. It's so great. I'm with you, know, you, Rich. I've got to do, um, I do these, you know, we do these DW playlist things and I've got to do Fitness Friday this Friday and just little little hacks for like staying healthy and fit, um, especially over the age of 50. Um, what, what are your secrets, man? You know, like I do, I do, I run, I speed yeah. walk, I, I take yeah. uh, cardio classes like Orange Theory or yeah. Barry's Boot Camp. Yeah. He's whim. Yeah, my thing is uh, low impact. Like, um, I love to run, and I've always loved running. I love hiking. I love walking. But, you know, I kind of got into the swimming thing years ago through a trainer friend of mine that said, you will never hurt yourself swimming. I've got friends that have had shoulder surgery. I'm just going to do light weights. Nobody just does light weights. Next thing you know, you're doing bigger weights, bigger dumbbells, doing this and that. And you're going to pull something. And if you, if Rich Redman or I pull something and we can't tour with Jason or with Ringo, we don't get paid. It doesn't, you know. <laughs> and I'm a capitalist, man. I want to play the drums and get paid. You know, I love to work. I'm from Detroit, working class. I want to play drums. I want to make sure I don't get hurt. And swimming 
swimming for an hour a day, you exercise every muscle. And yeah. I do, I'm a big Dodger baseball fan. I watch, I've watched, this is kind of sad, but for the last five years, I could have practiced a lot more. I practice a lot, but I could have practiced more. I have not missed with my MLB app on the road in Australia or wherever, or with Spectrum Sports on my life cycle bike, <laughs> low impact, two and a half hours of, I'll just go to level zero and I'll just be on the bike. But I do an hour of, of cardio on the bike and I do an hour of swimming. And I've not missed one Dodger game in five years. Nice. <laughs> and there's 162 games a year, not this year, but every year when we're not during the uh, crap we're in now. So anyway, um, yeah, that's my thing. And I don't drink alcohol. I don't eat sugar. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. It's hard enough staying healthy, you know, and keeping your brain cells. I take Prevagen, which is an ingredient found in jellyfish. Ringo got me into CoQ10, things that help and stimulate your memory. I was the only guy at my 40-year reunion that actually looked at the thing, and they had this thing, and I got everybody's name. Prevagen works, man. So does CoQ10. Our memories are everything. I remember asking Lee Sklar about a year ago, Lee, you played with James Taylor, you played with Phil Collins, all these tours. You've been recording since the 60s. You've never had a drink of alcohol, and you've never smoked or done drugs. How did you do that? He said, well, the people I worked with, they have periods of time. They just don't remember things. He said, I want to embrace everything in my life. I don't want to let memories go. I want to be cognizant. He said, why would I cloud my brain? Yeah. And so, it, you know, we're only here for a short time, man. You got to. That's really impressive. Gotta, I mean, I mean, I'm half Italian. So like going without the, some table wine uh, with my folks or whatever, I mean, that would be difficult for me. But uh, man, that is, that was really impressive, man. Really. Impressive. Well, I used to, I used to drink, you know, red wine for the heart, you know, and I'm from Michigan. So I grew up drinking beer like, you know, nobody's business. That's what people in Michigan do. And sure. Wisconsin, you drink beer. You know, the German, you know, factories, you know, Miller, Bush, you know, Strohs, <laughs> Labatt's, all this kind. But, man, you just, that just adds weight and calories. And I couldn't just have a glass of wine. I'd want the whole bottle because it's more fun. Who wants to just be tired? It's more fun to be drunk. And <laughs> then my son came on the scene at 22 years ago. And I went, man, I don't want to miss a second. I don't want to be cloudy with, oh, I only had a couple glasses of red wine. No, I missed a few things. I just said, I'm not missing a thing. And my daughter, 19 years ago, I got to be honest, I've got VHS, I've got DVDs, I've got iPhones after iPhones after iPhones and Blackberry. I've got so many pictures and photos and videos that I look at them and I remember being there because yes. I just want to be there. Well, you I also kind of, you so had I, children kind of late in life too, though. I was 39 I mean, when my son yeah. was born, I think. And I just said, okay, that's it. I don't want another sip of alcohol ever again. Yeah. And I never took one. So it's been 22 years. That's incredible. I, was, I wasn't, I wasn't a big drinker, but yeah. it's just, it, it's just drinking. My friends that would go on a session and go out to lunch and have a couple glasses of wine. I noticed they were slow and it makes you tired. I mean, I'd yeah. rather have coffee. I'm kind of a coffee addict actually that's my drug me too and i drink a lot of coffee a lot of italian espresso i like being up i never did cocaine or any drugs yeah. that make you up but i like i like the high of coffee because i feel awake i feel alert my friends oh this guitar part's hard yeah well you just had two glasses of red wine well what's Take the thing with, what's the thing with ringo where he eats more for nutrition it's like he's got a very specific diet because you notice that if somebody is in shape and is height weight proportionate in their 50s 60s and 70s it is not by accident no these guys and ringo was an addict you know he told me in 89 it was either die or mm. live and he did every drug known to man i said are there any drugs you didn't do he said yeah one aspirin <laughs> so he just quit everything and people that have that kind of drive you know like with with working out he's we could get back to the hotel at two in the morning and granted it's the ritz carlton of the four seasons and we've been on air ringo private plane but still it's two in the morning i'll get to the gym on my exercise bike to watch the dodger game for the night before on my app and he's already been in there for an hour running at 80 years old on a treadmill. Wow. Running, running. Good for so, him. And, and he has a baked potato and steamed broccoli every day. And, you know, every kind of food you could ever imagine is on here, Ringo. And he'll look back and just see us, not me so much, but see some of the guys just 
pagan at like midnight and then going to sleep on that. Edgar Winter would have two steak dinners and go to bed. You know? Oh my gosh. And, nah. Yeah. And uh, nah. so anyway, um, one of the guys, I won't mention his name. You would know this guy. He is eating a cliff bar. And Ringo says, why are you eating that cliff bar, brother? He said, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a protein bar, man. He says, protein, yeah. Seven grams of protein. 35 grams of sugar. You're not the guy on the cliff on the cover. You, I didn't see you in the gym this morning. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of sugar. And sugar causes cancer. Yeah. It's, not like a, it's not a conspiracy theory. Sugar smoking causes cancer, but so does sugar. Cancer loves sugar. The first thing somebody does that has cancer, whether they're going the chemo route or the burn it out with you know, radiation, poison it out and poison your whole body with chemo, cut it out and make it spread, or whatever they do, they say no sugar. Oh, couldn't you have told me that you know, 10 years ago? Sugar, mm. especially white sugar. If you're eating white sugar, you're eating bleach. If you mm. eat white salt, Salt is not always pure white. They bleach it. Flour is not usually pure virgin white like snow. They bleach it. So you're eating bleach. Bleach causes cancer. Wow, interesting. When did, we, when, did we, when did we start bleaching everything? When did cancer start becoming a big thing? When did we cut out vitamin B17 from our diets? I take B17 every day. You hear about B6, B9, B12. You don't hear about B17. Where do you have to go FDA to get B17? Does, Where do you go for that? You can't because it's illegal. The FDA cut it out because they know there it cures cancer. Where do you, you can get go it? to Mex You can go to Mexico and get laetrile treatments if you've got cancer. Liquid B17. You can get it uh, if you take apricots, if you eat apricot seeds. But the FDA said, well, there's cyanide in apricot seeds. You can die. You can take one apricot seed for every 10 pounds of body weight, and mm. it's cool. So if I weigh... 170. I can have 17 seeds a day. I'm not going to die of cyanide poisoning. You can dr die from drinking too much water. If you drank 20 gallons of water a day, you could drown. But anyway, amygdalin is boiled down B17 in the pill form. I take 500 milligrams a day. Laetrile, it's illegal in America. That's liquid B17. You can go to Mexico to Oasis of Hope, and they will give you laetrile in, you know, in, uh, uh, injections. Wow. But uh, eat apricot seeds, man. Just don't eat more than, than 10 for every, uh, one for every 10 pounds of body weight. But B17, man, when the, when, the, when the people were coming over from England on the boats six months a year on a boat and they're dying of scurvy and rickets, they started putting lemons and limes under the boat. They didn't die anymore because the rickets and scurvy were a deficiency di disease. Mm -hmm. No vitamin C. Yep. That's why they call them limeys. <clears throat> they put the limes under the boat. Cancer is a deficiency disease. Sure, you're going to get lung cancer if you smoke. Sure, you're going to eat bleach and get cancer. But if you don't have any B17, if you take a lot of B17, I'm just saying, I don't oh, know yeah. who watches your show. I don't, gonna, want the yeah. FDA, I don't want the FDA coming here knocking on the door, hey. canceling me. Hey. Yeah, Pizza is totally. uh, very healthy, too. <laughs> Pizza is the greatest, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Greg, I know a lot of sugar. You've got to go into yes. teaching more people from around the world, and there's a sandwich waiting on you. We've got a quick question for you. It's my favorite part of the show. Jim's going to ask you a completely random question of the day. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. This is indeed a random question. What job does not exist now, but will exist in the future? Hmm. Musically, drumming, or just anything? Anything. Well, it's, it's going to be one of the biggest employers of the world, I think, pretty soon. Contact tracers. Mm. Uh, Interesting. Absolutely. I'm, it's, I'm, it's unbelievable that, that, how they do that. Don't get me started, man. I'm not <laughs> going down that road. Yes, yeah, right. No, I, I, I hear you. So, Greg, this was so enjoyable. And this is, you're the kind of guy I know. I mean, you're so talented, but you're such a fun hang. This conversation could go on for hours. But if people want to find you, they want to take drum lessons, they want to reach out to you, what's the best way to find you? The best way is to email my manager, Frank Rosado. He's, at, he's got a great studio, Woodcliff Studios, where I record and it's a teaching facility and everything else. But just email Greg, G-R-E-G-G, -E -G -G, drums, D-R-U-M-S, the number two at gmail.com. Greg drums two at gmail.com with two Gs at the end. I love it. And oh. he will respond. He will respond. I love it. Well, thanks so much. Because he gets the percentage. 
<laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, we're surrounded by ten percenters, man. Yeah. Everybody's got their hands. What in the do pot. you mean? What do you mean fifteen percent? Oh, I can't do it for twenty percent. What do you mean twenty five percent? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Rich and Jim. Thank you for being here. This was a lot of fun. And uh, all the best to you guys and God bless you. And keep keep doing what you're doing, man. Oh man, I hope to see Absolutely. you this all goes away, man, in sunny Los Angeles. We pre- really appreciate you joining us. And to all the listeners, thank you guys so much. Subscribe, share, rate, review. We sure appreciate it. Keep coming back for the good stuff. See you next time. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com.